Welcome to When Gen X Ruled the Multiplex, where I scrutinize films that might have helped shape the minds of those of us who are members of the MTV generation. 1982's Poltergeist was based on a story idea by Steven Spielberg, with a screenplay written by Spielberg along with Michael Grace and Mark Victor. Spielberg was also the executive producer of the film. Poltergeist was directed by Toby Hooper, famous for the 1974 low-budget horror classic The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. To this day, controversy persists over who really directed the film, Hooper or Spielberg. Following a slew of onset reports that Spielberg was micromanaging the production to the extent that Hooper was little more than his assistant, Spielberg ran an open letter in The Hollywood Reporter in 1982 to make it clear that Hooper was in charge. Nonetheless, a persistent sentiment lingers that Poltergeist is a Steven Spielberg film, not a Toby Hooper film. We open as an instrumental version of the Star Spangled Banner plays over grainy scenes of national monuments. Gen Xers, along with members of earlier generations, will instantly realize we're watching a US television Television network sign off for the night. At the conclusion of the song, the TV channel goes to static. We're in the nice suburban home of the Freeling family, and family patriarch Steve has fallen asleep in front of the TV. Their very good golden retriever E Buzz heads upstairs to check in on Steve's wife Diane, their teen daughter Dana, and their two youngest children, Robbie and Carol Ann. The dog's name, E Buzz, is a reference to a recurring character played by Dan Aykroyd on Saturday Night Live, which was an excellent topical joke in 1982. Steve is played by Craig T. Nelson, famous for the sitcom Coach, while Diane is played by Joe Beth Williams, famous in the 80s for The Big Chill, as well as for the made-for-TV film about nuclear Armageddon that traumatized absolutely everyone in 1983, The Day After. Oldest daughter Dana is played by Dominique Dunn, daughter of noted journalist Dominic Dunn. Robbie is played by Oliver Robbins, and Carol Ann is played by Heather O'Rourke. A grim fact everyone remembers about Poltergeist is that both actresses died extremely young. Dominique Dunn was murdered by her ex-boyfriend in 1982, a few months after Poltergeist was released, and Heather O'Rourke died in 1988 at age 12 of septic shock. Oliver Robbins, thankfully, is alive and well. I went to film school with him. Carol Ann wakes up and walks downstairs where the television is broadcasting static to the dark room. She kneels before the TV and begins to talk to it. The other family members wake up and look on in confusion as she carries on a one-sided conversation with the television set. The day breaks on the Cuesta Verde Estates, a planned suburban neighborhood outside of Los Angeles. The Freelings enjoy their weekend. Dad Steve, who is a top-selling realtor with the development company, is watching a football game with a bunch of rowdy friends. Oldest daughter Dana is eating an extremely 80s breakfast of celery and a big bowl of cottage cheese, and Mom Diane is straightening the younger kids' bedroom before noticing that Carol Ann's pet canary Tweety has died. The television keeps switching away from the game because the Freelings' terrible next-door neighbor Ben, played by Michael McManus, is watching Mr. Rogers, and his remote control operates on the same bandwidth as the Freelings. Diane goes to flush the dead canary down the toilet, in a scene that has been causing plumbers to recoil in horror for close to 40 years now. She's caught by Carol Ann, who insists they bury Tweety in the backyard in a cigar box filled with flowers, licorice, and photos. A lightning storm strikes that night. In their bedroom, Diane and Steve get absolutely baked while watching TV and reading in bed and giggling at things that seem hilarious when you're stoned. Meanwhile, Robbie loves lies awake, justly terrified of his creepy life-size clown doll sitting in a bedside chair. Robbie interrupts his parents being silly in bed to point out that the storm is drawing closer. He tells his dad he's scared of the creepy tree outside his bedroom window, which is the only thing in the film that might be even scarier than the creepy life-size clown doll. Steve soothes his fear by teaching him how to count between lightning and thunderstrikes to tell when the storm is moving away. The storm moves even closer, however, and the younger kids end up snuggling in bed with their parents as the TV plays the Star Spangled Banner. As soon as the TV goes to static, we hear whispering voices. Carol Ann gets out of bed and once again kneels in front of the TV. She reaches out to the screen, and a skeletal hand reaches back for her. It then becomes ghostly tendrils of light that fill the room before exiting through the wall. In the morning, construction workers bulldoze the Freeling backyard, digging up poor Tweety in the process, to break ground on a new swimming pool. Weird things happen while the kids eat breakfast. Robbie's milk glass explodes in his hand, and his cutlery bends by itself. Carol Ann tunes the TV to a dead channel so she can talk to what she calls the TV people. The dining table chairs rearrange themselves in elaborate patterns whenever Diane 
Ann's back is turned, and Carol Ann confirms that this is the work of the TV people. Another lightning storm strikes that night. The lightning gets closer and closer, and the creepy tree smashes through the bedroom window, grabs Robbie with one gnarled branch, and tries its best to eat him. Steve and Diane manage to pull him to safety before the entire tree gets sucked into a super localized black tornado that tears through their backyard. Carol Ann, left alone in the bedroom, is pulled into a glowing white light radiating from the bedroom closet. The Freelings search everywhere for her, but Carol Ann has vanished. The TV is on in the master bedroom, tuned to static, and Robbie hears Carol Ann calling out for her mom from inside the TV. In the morning, Steve consults with a parapsychologist named Dr. Lesh, who, along with her associates Marty and Ryan, heads to the house to investigate Carol Ann's disappearance. Dr. Lesh is played by Beatrice Strait, Oscar winner for Best Supporting Actress for 1976's Network. Marty is played by Martin Casella, Steven Spielberg's former assistant, while Ryan is played by Richard Lawson, whom we have already seen in Streets of Fire. Carol Ann's bedroom has become a nonstop swirling vortex of energy. Dr. Lesh suspects this is all the work of a poltergeist, most likely associated with the spirit of one single individual. While Dr. Lesh observes, Diane speaks to Carol Ann, who tells her mother she can see a light. On Dr. Lesh's urging, Diane orders Carol Ann to stay away from the light. At night, Dr. Lesh explains to Diane and Robbie that when some people die due to unresolved issues, they don't cross over into the afterlife. They resist going into the light and instead hang around the real world as confused spirits. Ryan and Marty stay up all night to monitor the paranormal activity. Marty goes to the kitchen for a snack, and the poltergeist decides to mess with him by making him hallucinate various terrors, like seeing his face peel right off his skull. Mysterious spectral creatures made of light come down the stairs and disappear into the living room ceiling. In the morning, Robbie and the dog are packed off to stay with Grandma while Dana stays with a friend. Steve's slimy boss, Mr. Teague, played by James Karen, takes Steve on a tour of a plot of land which will be used in the next phase of development. He casually mentions that Steve's entire neighborhood is built on top of a relocated cemetery, which, yes, will prove significant. Dr. Lesh brings extra help in the form of a squeaky voice psychic named Tangina. A stressed out Steve is uncharacteristically bitchy about this development, to the point of making a munchkin joke about Tangina, who is a person of short stature. Way to be a dick, Steve. Tangina is played by Zelda Rubenstein, whom we have seen in Sixteen Candles. According to Tangina, the spirits trapped in the house are attracted to Carol Ann's life force, which they are confusing with the light that represents the afterlife. Tangina also senses a terrible angry presence, whom she calls the Beast, who is using Carol Ann to distract the other spirits from going into the light. Tangina enters the children's bedroom and tosses tennis balls into the closet. They emerge out the living room ceiling, which means she's found both the entrance and the exit to the paranormal realm where Carol Ann is being kept. She ties ropes around Diane and sends her into the closet, then urges the other spirits to go into the light. A terrible, giant, glowing, skeletal monster head tries to prevent Diane from rescuing Carol Ann, but Steve and the others manage to pull Carol Ann and Diane, covered in mysterious goop, out of the paranormal realm. Now that the trapped spirits have ostensibly moved into the afterlife, Tangina and Dr. Lesh leave, and the Freelings very sensibly pack up to move. The night before the move, Robbie is attacked by the creepy clown doll, which tries its best to strangle him. Something awful to tries to suck Carol Ann and Robbie into the closet, and a terrifying skeletal creature prevents Diane from entering the bedroom to save them. While running for help, Diane falls into the half-completed swimming pool, where coffins and skeletons rise up out of the collected rainwater and surround her. She finally manages to enter the bedroom and pulls Carol Ann and Robbie to safety. Steve arrives home from work to find his house glowing and filled with skeletons. Steve yells at Mr. Teague for failing to relocate the bodies from the cemetery when he built the Cuesta Verde Estates, which, of course, is the root cause of all this poltergeist activity. The whole family, dog included, piles into the car and speeds away as the entire house collapses in on itself and disappears in a burst of light. Exhausted and traumatized, the Freelings check into the Holiday Inn, where Steve removes the TV from their room and dumps it outside. Poltergeist was followed by two sequels, 1986's Poltergeist 2, The Other Side, which reunited most of the original cast, and and 1988's Poltergeist 3, in which only Heather O'Rourke and Zelda Rubenstein returned. O'Rourke died before filming was completed, and Carol Ann's scenes were finished with a stand-in. While the original Poltergeist was critically acclaimed and received three Academy Award nominations, including one for Jerry Goldsmith's memorable score, the sequels were widely panned. A television series, Poltergeist The Legacy, ran for four seasons on cable, and then a remake of the original Poltergeist, featuring a poster that capitalized on lingering Gen X fears about that creepy clown doll, was released in 2015. Poltergeist is that odd beast where it's a film about ghosts, and it's loaded with scares and even a bit of gore, 
but it really isn't what we traditionally think of as a horror film. The most famous example of a non-horror film centered around ghosts would be Ghostbusters, of course, but unlike Ghostbusters, Poltergeist isn't a comedy. Poltergeist is a family drama where the drama revolves around ghosts, much like Steven Spielberg's E.T., which was released one week after Poltergeist, is a family drama where the drama revolves around a lost alien stranded on Earth. Poltergeist was released before the advent of the PG-13 rating, and thus, despite some scary themes and images, it was rated PG. And that makes sense. It has a body count of zero, and while it's not specifically made for kids, much of it is appealing to young viewers, because the young characters, like the adult characters, are well developed and seem like real people. I first watched Poltergeist at a friend's slumber party when I was probably nine, with a whole bunch of other little girls with the party host parents asleep in bed, and it was fine for that age group to watch unsupervised. We were all extremely scared by the film, but in a fun way. The film has a great many grace notes that I appreciate, like the way Dr. Lush and Diane share a flask and bond with each other during the prolonged trauma, or the way Ryan immediately lowers his video camera when it's not certain whether Diane and Carol Ann survived their escape from the paranormal realm, or the way the terrible next-door neighbors come over to help a panicked Diane out of the swimming pool when she's surrounded by skeletons. And there are small, sly bits of humor, too. I love how we're given subtle hints that go unmentioned by the other characters that teen daughter Dana is a party girl. Like how she mysteriously knows an awful lot about the Holiday Inn down the road, or how she arrives home from staying with a friend with visible hickeys on her neck. Poltergeist has a pretty elegant screenplay in which we're given just enough explanation about what's going on in the Freeling family home to have the paranormal activity make sense, but we're not given so much explanation that it drains the film of all mystery. I also appreciate how Poltergeist telegraphs bits of the story in advance. The Freeling Ling's remote control that operates on the same bandwidth as their neighbors is unrelated to anything connected to the poltergeist, but it primes us for the mysterious events that will soon start happening. The way Tweety is accidentally dug up by the workers digging the swimming pool primes us for the actual human corpses that will later rise up out of that same freshly dug pool. I also love how Carol Ann receives messages from a paranormal realm through the static on her TV set, which is an idea that made a great deal of sense to Gen Xers. As we learned in school and as Mark Marty and Ryan explicitly point out in the film, static on analog television sets comes from radio waves from many places, including from deep space, which is a very evocative and slightly sinister concept. Poltergeist plays on that idea by having Carol Ann receive messages in the TV static sent from some realm existing between life and death. If there's a moment that all Gen Xers remember from Poltergeist, it's that image of little Carol Ann sitting in front of a television set tuned to a dead channel, listening to messages from beyond that only she can hear. Next time we are going to listen to more messages from beyond when I look at John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. Thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you then. 